Globetrotters podcast, the show dedicated to bringing you fresh and diverse perspectives from traveling enthusiasts all over the world. Here at the Globetrotters podcast, we hope to show that travel is so much more than how it's represented on social media and television by bringing you real stories, thoughtful discussions on ethical issues, and investigations into how you can make the most of an adventure without breaking the bank. I'm your co-host, Jonathan Otero. And I'm Maximil Gonzalez. And in our last episode, John interviewed Alice Norton. This episode demystified remote work in 2023. Honestly, it's a great episode for anyone that wants independence and a fully remote gig while traveling and being employed. Definitely. And that's what makes today's show special and relevant. Lately, we've been trying to partner episodes with a professional in the field who can educate our listeners and us about topics that pertain to travel. Alice wrote a great article in her newsletter about embracing the digital nomad life and giving helpful tips and tricks to help people secure their dream remote job in 2023. And today we have Rogan Steele. And I know what you're thinking. That's not an alias. He just has a great name. (laughs) Rogan is a Canadian who has lived in New Zealand for nearly a decade and is well into his sec his two year long adventure of traveling the globe with his girlfriend turned fiance. We'll get into those deets and how it happened a little bit later. But both of them have embraced the digital nomad lifestyle, embodying some of the tips that Alice outlined in her pod. So far, Logan has been on the road for nearly sixteen months, and so far he's been to Indonesia, Portugal, Canada. Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. And you still have a few more countries to visit before you're done. Rogan, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Hey, guys. Uh, Super excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Great. And listen, there's so many questions we have for you about, quote unquote, the digital nomad lifestyle and what that means in practicality. But before we get there, I think a lot of people are listening and thinking, two years traveling the globe. How are you paying for this? It's my understanding that you had a corporate job and saved anywhere between 50 to 75% of your earnings for years. That's a lot of dedication and sacrifice to build up to this trip. Can you talk a little bit about why you wanted to do a trip on this scale and what sacrifices you had to make in your day-to-day life to make this trip a reality? Yeah, super good question. Um, so I, I won't go too far into my backstory, but um, I definitely took a little bit more of an untraditional route uh, when I was young. I did my first trip overseas when I was 18. I didn't go mm-hmm. to college. Uh, and so I got a taste for travel at a, at a really young age. And uh, like everyone else, eventually, of course, I uh, kind of fell into the traditional route of a corporate nine to five. Um, Mm -hmm. which has its positives and negatives. It obviously allowed me to save a lot of money. Um, And after doing the first trip uh, and really, really uh, getting the travel bug, uh, I think for me, saving my paycheck, you know, it took time. I was young and I was figuring out kind of what to do with money. Uh, (laughs) That's something I wish they taught you more in school, but they don't. (laughs) Um, And so over time, I just kind of realized that You know, I was still able to attend social events and uh, maybe not eat out as much and do the things I still like to do, but but save the vast majority of that paycheck. So that would involve, you know, cooking for myself every day and not eating out for lunch. And maybe instead of going to the bars on weekends, I would buy a box of beers and go to a friend's house instead. So it was really simple stuff that allowed me to to still maintain a good social life, um, but also see that savings account grow. And that's probably the biggest key point here is for the first couple thousand dollars, it doesn't seem like much, but when you start seeing it get to six or seven, eight, 10, 15, you almost get addicted to (laughs) To your savings account growing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Especially knowing what you want to use it for. So for me, um, you know, I've never had, I've never gotten to the stage in my life where a house and a car were were my priority. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll happen in the future, but you know, it, it's always been um, these trips that I've saved for. So uh, I did a year long trip in 2018 on my own. I did a solo travel through Southeast Asia. Um, and of course this was the biggest trip I had ever done. And yeah. I did that trip with probably about uh, 12 to 15,000 US dollars. I managed to make that last a year. So 
I knew that I could do it. And I knew that that was an, an amount of money that was not too insane to save up. Uh, yeah. And so for this big trip uh, with my partner, I came back to New Zealand because at the time she wasn't quite ready to leave, but she decided, hey, you know what, if you come back to New Zealand, um, I'll go with you this time. And so we kind of both put our heads down, uh, worked really hard and saved a lot of money um, with the intention of leaving and just kind of seeing where life was going to take us. What budget did you have in mind? And have you been like too strict or too loose about it? Uh, you know, what was your mindset there? Yeah. So, uh, funny enough, I'm not much of a planner. I'm very much, a just, just go with the flow kind of guy. My partner is, there's a little bit more of a planner. And so based on previous trips for me, like, uh, I know I can manage on a budget of probably, um, safely like 1500 to 2000 us dollars a month for me is a, is a really good budget that sometimes, of course, if you're doing more crazy adventure activities, you might go over. And then other months, uh, you know, if we're just doing some work and, you know, doing cheap free walking tours and lots of other things that don't cost much money, it's, it's super easy to maintain that for us. And Brogan, um, is that through yeah. experience or did you learn that from someone? That was mostly through my own experience. Uh, I've done trips with very, very little money. Like I said, 18 yeah. in Europe, yeah. you know, I did, I did trips with very little money and then um, I've done trips with a bit more, but it was mostly just through experience. And, um, and like I said, surviving off that 12 to 15,000 US for an entire year, I just kind of looked at it and went, wow, I actually, you know, I did it. And that was, that was kind of, a, that was an even smaller budget, but of course I was young and I was staying in cheaper hostels then. And, uh, you know, I was living on a much tighter budget. I could eat noodles and I didn't have a partner to, you know, get mad at me for eating noodles every night. So <laughs> <laughs> this one was a little different and maybe required a bit more budget, but at the same time I knew, uh, I knew it was very doable. And, uh, of course, traveling alone versus with a partner can change things too. You know, we're able to um, split the cost of accommodation and uh, we're able to split the cost of a lot of things, which can make stuff a little cheaper sometimes as well. So, yeah. and, and, you know, from talking to you and meeting you, I know you have a lot of cool experiences and specifically around this trip. I do want to talk about some of the iconic cities and countries that you've been to, mm -hmm. but before we get there, I want to first focus on the term mm -hmm. digital nomad. Yeah. I think oftentimes people intertwine a intertwine a travel influencer with a digital nomad. The two aren't synonymous, but they're often labeled in the same category. How do you distinguish between the two and do you consider yourself one or the other? Yeah, I, this is a really, really good question because I've thought about this a lot and I've had many discussions with people about it. Um, you know, I, so like everyone else, I, I'd spent many, many years trying to figure out what it is I want to do with my life and pursue and uh, a couple of years, probably about two years before we left, I decided to quit my job and uh, pursue um, videography and cinematography and filmmaking full time. Um, so I would never, I, I would not consider myself an influencer, uh, <laughs> even though maybe, maybe there is some people I influence, but I guess the term digital nomad to me definitely resonates a little bit more. I mean, it's a very broad term, of course, but uh, you know, for me, it's, I always loved creating content about my travels and it was primarily for me. It was never yeah, for anyone yeah. else. It was, you know, I was always a big journaler that. on my trips. I would love to journal and, you know, because I don't know if you've ever done it yourself, but me reading back my journals from my first trips, uh, I think nothing makes me laugh more in the world. It's hilarious <laughs> how much, how much you forget and the small details of the people you meet and the things that happen and, and so for me, video is just kind of a, a another step uh, to that. And so, yeah, and, and you know, in this trip, uh, it's been a lot of just figuring out for both of us, myself and my partner, figuring out what the lifestyle of actually being a digital nomad is, or or what even just being a digital nomad is in general. Yeah. Um, and so that's taken a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of like introspective and extrospective you know, view and looking at, at what it means and if this is what we really want. And um, we've, we found out a lot of really cool things along the way about ourselves. So a digital nomad is a person who travels freely while working remotely uh, using yep. technology and the internet 
what do you, I mean, you mentioned filmmaking. Um, what do you and your fiance do for work? And can you tell us a bit about the pros and cons of the digital nomad workspace uh, you operate in? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I am a filmmaker, but I'm quite new to the industry. So like I said, I quit my job a couple years before uh, to pursue it full time. I didn't have any formal education or anything. So it was, I've always been a very much just like with my planning, a learn on the fly kind of guy. Yeah. Um, and so, <laughs> it's, yeah. Way. And so I just, you know, I got freelance gigs doing weddings and uh, some small advertisements and things along those lines. And of course, I've always loved um, kind of expressing myself in my own way via YouTube and things. Um, on the other hand, my partner, she is a designer who does have a formal education. She's a strategist and a, a creative a graphic designer, you could say. Um, and so she has about a decade experience. Now, she followed the same path. She quit her job about a year before to dip her toes into the world of freelancing and kind of getting accustomed to you know, not working in an agency and going to work every day and just getting a little bit used to that lifestyle. Um, but of course, nothing's ever going to really prepare you for, uh, you know, traveling around and trying to find clients. So I would say, uh, you know, for us, it's, uh, I guess, being a digital nomad does require a, a lot of, uh, a lot of sacrifice. There's a lot of positives and a lot of negatives. The positives are very obvious. You know, you get to live in, uh, these amazing, beautiful countries that are so culturally rich and so different from where we've all grown up. And anyone who has traveled and enjoys traveling knows that that's one of the things we all love the most, you know, to be engrossed in a, in a different culture and a life. So every day is kind of new and exciting. Um, but at the same time, you know, you still have to work. And so it's quite funny. I get a lot of people who say, how do you do it? You know, like it's to, to most people, I think from the outside, it, it feels like every day is, you know, a blast and we're going to a fiesta at some hostel and things like that. But in reality, you know, sometimes we have two or three weeks where we, we really don't move. We sit here at the kitchen table and we work and we cook dinner and, you know, we might go out one night a week, but we live a very, very normal life and things like, you know, finding a place with good internet that's affordable and, you know, I don't know, close to certain amenities. These are things that most travelers wouldn't consider that they're on their trip. And while we're on the topic, I, you know, I want to kind of educate our, our listeners here a little bit and talk a little bit about that work-life balance that I think you're talking about. You know, everyone's different, including you and your partner, but how do you try to actually split your time between play and work and how hard is it to stay disciplined as you already touched on with, you know, your journaling? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, so it definitely depends on the stage you're at too. So for me, I spend a lot of my time trying to acquire work. You know, this is, and it goes back to what I said before. It's, it's nothing is as easy as it seems, you know, people make it seem like it is a very easy thing to do, but uh, everything, everything good takes time, you know, and I'm still in the process of, of, I suppose, um, managing or trying to get, I guess, full-time income from this lifestyle. My, my partner's cracked it. She's uh, much, much further along. She's dedicated a decade of her life to this. So uh, for me, it's, you know, it's still a timely process. But in terms of how we manage our time, I mean, it's actually worked out quite nicely traveling with a partner and doing this sort of work because, um, had we not had this work to entertain ourselves after 16 months of seeing each other 24 hours a day, uh, you know, you might get a little tired of seeing each other. So <laughs> the normal day-to-day -day life, you're, you, you and your partner or girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever, will, you know, would go to work and you see each other after work and, you know, and then same, same, and you spend weekends together. So this is very much, you are together all the time. And so for us, it's, you know, very much, we do keep a semi Monday to Friday uh, or, you know, yeah, Monday to Friday schedule where we wake up and we make some coffee and some breakfast, we get to work. And a lot of it is on the fly. We say, hey, there's, um, you know, there's salsa night tonight at this bar. And we go, sure. Okay, let's clock off at three today, you know, go out and roam the streets a bit and then we'll go do some salsa. You know? which, so you would, which you would do at a regular office anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's just very much, uh, I don't know, someday we go, Hey, let's, uh, work in the evening tonight. So we wake up early and we go out and, 
uh, get a bus somewhere and do something cool. And then we start work at four. So it's obviously we're not constricted by the time, probably as much as you would be on a normal day to day life. But um, I would say we still, you know, we both do a lot of work and we're both very driven and passionate about what we do. And so, yeah, it's not, it's not as that, I wouldn't say that's one of the burdens of, uh, of this sort of lifestyle. But you know what I would say about that? I think these are the aspects. What you're talking about right now is so important because this is what's happening behind the scenes. People see your content. They see the cool videos, the shots, but they're not seeing the actual you know, effort that's going into just working six or seven hours, whether it's early mornings, late afternoons. And, and so I think a lot of the time people will just envy it without being uh, the type of person who's going to put in the work or effort to, to make that a reality because yeah. you do work and it's, it's, it's necessary to sustain the lifestyle. Of course. And, you know, time goes by very fast. And so, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I noticed this when I was in Canada, for instance, um, I did some, I guess you could say uh, normal work. <laughs> I, I went and my father works in logistics. So I went to do some, some manual labor work to, you know, maybe get a bit of extra money. And uh, I didn't post uh, much at all for maybe a month and a half, two months, but that period of time, people, very much forget and then if you, yeah. you go back to posting a week later they're like it's it feels to them like a continuation of you've just yeah. been living this life every day you know uh so that is very very applicable and i think it's one of those things that no matter who you look at whether it's the most famous instagrammer or youtuber or whoever you know they, they're not going to post them sitting at a desk every day uh and and what you see is, of course, the fun and the amazing stuff that they're able to produce and see. But yeah, as you said, um, so much of that time is spent uh, just having maybe a cooler view than your house. Don't get me wrong. There is benefits <laughs> to working in these places, but but you're still just sitting at your computer with with maybe a nicer view. That's for yeah. You mean you're not seeing squirrels outside of your <laughs> hotel right now? No, I'm seeing some alpacas in the distance. Yeah. <laughs> you can see Machu Picchu from your room, right? Like that's of course. It's right there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the biggest challenges you keep bringing up is finding work and finding clients. Uh, what applications and tools do you use to help you find more work? Yeah. So, um, so this. This is definitely part of the journey, which is, you know, finding out one, of course, what you like to do. But in reality, we can't only do what we like to do. We also have to do some things that we're just good at. And so um, to answer your question quickly, uh, it would be so Upwork and Fiverr and applications like this. I think people have spoken mm -hmm. about them previously. Yeah. You know, they're fantastic ways to find work. But I think people forget uh, how valuable um, a little bit of um self-driven uh, hunting is or self-motivation. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm trying to think of the words to put uh, here, but, you know, reaching out to friends who might be in your industry or not even just friends, just people you have you might not know of or using something like LinkedIn to just, you really have to get out there and reach out. So for me, a good example of this is uh, I, you know, by trade was a videographer, cinematographer, things mm -hmm. like this, but um, I didn't do much animation or motion graphics, but I knew that that would be maybe not just more lucrative, but also there would probably be a few more opportunities in the industry yeah. for that yeah. abroad. So, so I just self <clears throat> self taught while we were on the road, um, learned some new applications, uh, learned the ins and outs of them and how to use them in my spare time. And that has led to my partner being able to, um, I guess, uh, hand people over to me or when someone inquires to her because she's in the industry, she obviously can throw my name out there. Mm -hmm. And so this, this it's doesn't a have to be a partnership. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's mm -hmm. also very much, we are lucky. Yeah. It's a partnership in terms of our industries, Correct. but um, even if she wasn't my partner, you know, having that skill set and, you know, knowing a friend, I could say, Hey, if anyone's ever looking for this sort of work, could you throw my name out there? You know? So I guess broadening your skill set is also to me equally as important as just maybe pinpointing on one thing and trying to find work in, in that industry. It's uh, you can do that, but in terms of finding work, it's going to be super beneficial to you to, to, I guess, broaden your horizons a bit and go, okay, mm -hmm. not just what am I good at, 
what do I, what can I learn and what can I get yeah. better at? Um, you know, so. And where can you source these different re- uh, avenues of revenue? Right. So exactly. Yeah. 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 It, it's like, like everyone nowadays, right. You don't want to have, uh, if you can manage it, you know, you'd like to have income coming from maybe a few different avenues. So mm-hmm. a lot of people go setting up online shops and there's a million and one ways, um, but all of them coming back to, you know, they take time. Nothing yeah. is going to happen overnight. And I think that's the biggest thing is, uh, you know, you, people have to have patience and you might have to live off noodles and broccoli, uh, you know, for two months, if that means, and if you really want to, live this lifestyle uh, you know that's what it means you yeah. might have to do it. agreed so, yeah yeah you uh you bring up traveling with your partner quite a bit uh let's talk mm-hmm. the let's talk the dynamics of traveling with a partner um yeah. it's one thing to go on vacation for a few days or living right. together or working different jobs that you know you have time apart they separate you you know for most of the day uh, but yeah. both of you are living in this lifestyle which means you spend the majority of your time together uh, what has that experience been like for you? Yeah, it's been really, really cool. I mean, I've all of my previous trips have been solo. Um, I've you know been with friends on and off and things like that. But you know, when you travel solo, you obviously can wake up whenever you want, go wherever you want, and eat whatever mm-hmm. you want, and and you have no other <laughs> opinion. You have no other opinion that that joins into that. So this is a, very much a life that I'm I'm used to. Uh, you know, being a, being a young bachelor, but um, yeah. So me and me and my partner, before we left, it was kind of funny. You know, we both said to each other, Hey, this will be the, the ultimate test. Right. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I never, I never mentioned engagement before, but you know, I've, uh, I always had the idea in mind. Um, we're very close. And so uh, going on this trip together was always going to be that ultimate test. Uh, and I think um, overall, you know, when you're traveling, everything is new and exciting and fun. And so for the most part, it's fantastic to share an experience with someone else that you care so much about, uh, instead of just yourself, you know, it is very, very, it's, it's great to have those shared experiences. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there, there are many, many moments where no matter who the two people are, if it's your brother, your cousin, your mom, uh, you're going to have large disagreements Mm -hmm. about some, sometimes, I would actually argue most of the time it's about the tiniest things. It's not even the big things. <laughs> the big things are easy. It's normally the small stuff. And, and yeah, of like, course, you know, go, what's that? Oh, I was just going to say, just like trying to decide which couch to keep. Uh, but go exactly. on. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The smallest things like that, which couch to keep or yeah, which Airbnb has the nicer couch. I don't know. You know, it's <laughs> very much that's the case. Um, but yeah, the overall experience is... Um, is something I would recommend for, for anybody. Like, like I said, whether it is your for brother better or worse. Yeah. For better or worse. But at the end of the day, uh, you're either going to probably never speak again, or you'll be the closest you've ever been in your life yeah. after an experience yeah, yeah, like yeah. this. So totally. Um, agree. Yeah. Yeah. You have to resolve issues that get brought up. There is no um, ignoring until they go away. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a topic that I can, spend an entire day talking about just the dynamics between you know the travelers you meet and the impact that they can have in your life even if it's just a brief conversation um you know just to give our listeners context uh rogan and i met while diving in belize and we you know i I spent a full week there but i didn't i only we only spent about half a day together on this diving (laughs) expedition and and you know it's led to all this so which which i'm thankful for just that experience we had a good time uh but but you brought up like airbnbs and deciding which one has the better sofa um so i want to talk a little bit about that it's when do you decide as as a couple or as a team when to splurge or when to rein in the spending you mentioned that one of your airbnbs and i found this really funny had a blender and how yeah. awesome and excited you were that an Airbnb had a blender. So yes. how do you how do you make those decisions? Yeah, so <laughs> uh, dude, blenders. I mean, uh, things like that. <laughs> a, a little George Foreman grill that you can make toasties in. Like, ooh. just uh, don't grill your foot with it. You'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You'll yeah. be good. But um, yeah, so the kind of the way we travel is, uh, you know, of course, somewhat dictated by the work that's happening too. So. 
we, we might have two or three clients on the go at one time. And therefore, you know, it's kind of tricky to do the kind of classical day-to-day -day traveling through countries. Um, so uh, Guatemala was a good example and Belize actually where we moved fairly quickly. So we would spend two days here, go on to the next place, see some cool stuff, three days here. And during those times, we'll normally spend a little less on accommodation. We'll stay at some hostels to meet some people and make some friends and figure out where they're going and more of the quintessential travel, I suppose you could say. And then after probably about, you know, a month of doing that, uh, we will say, okay, it's time we maybe rein it in a little bit and focus a bit more on work. So this is actually kind of leading back to your other question of really how we manage our time with work-life balance uh, is we'll do it in big chunks. So uh, after a month of s s lots of excitement and lots of people and places and cool stuff, we'll say, okay, uh, let's find a city we like. And, you know, obviously one that's kind of close ideally. And, uh, and let's find a nice Airbnb that's comfortable and has a blender and a, a, a rice cooker if we're lucky and a <laughs> kettle and, you know, a fridge and, so uh, this is what we'll do is we'll say, okay, let's spend a little bit more money somewhere comfy for the two of us. Um, and, and we can have a bit more of a productive working environment because this is one of the things I, uh, probably one of my biggest weaknesses is I'm able to be self-motivated and productive, but when I am in like a hostile environment, I very much so can get FOMO very quickly. I'm sat there on my laptop trying to work and there's, four cool looking guys and girls who I'd love to go meet and have a beer with. And so for us to kind of, we almost have to flip the switch of, you know, traveling with a bit of work, we can still get it done, but uh, going to an environment where we can really hunker down and, you know, be productive and get a lot of work done. And yeah. So. I don't know about you, Max, but I'm the exact same way. I was just about to say that's a unique uh, perspective and insight on the whole uh, travel and work dynamic because a lot of people I think would, you know, immediately default to day by day. How do you day by day split up your time between work and play? But, yeah. you know, you, like you said, weeks or a month of like, you know, hostels, hanging out, going and doing really fun things, and then a month of hunkering down and putting in that work. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people don't think about it in terms of that long term uh, commitment, right? It's day by day, like, oh, for the first four hours, six hours, eight hours, I'm going to work, then I'm going to go out, right? 100%. But, yes. Yeah, I think that's a and really this, unique way to uh, think about it. Yeah, and it was, uh, now that I think about it, you know, trying to, that's why I struggled to answer your question at first, John, was because I'm going, how do we manage <laughs> our day by day? But in, in reality, it is a lot more long term in that sense. It'll be week, week by week or or month by month is, is way more of how we balance it. So, yeah. And even, you know, you saying that I, I, I kind of caught myself, like the problem was in the question because I'm asking it from my perspective, how would I approach traveling for this amount of time? Because I am the type of individual that would need to break it up. Like, okay, on Monday, I am going to work for four to five hours in the morning or the afternoon. This is what we're going to plan for the afternoon or vice versa. Uh, I leave myself very little room for spontaneity in situations like that, which I've realized yeah. through this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely with a partner dynamic too. being solo. Of course you can do this on your own, but you know uh, it's communication with my partner too. She'll say, Hey, you know what? Look next week. I really, I've got a lot on. Uh, and so, you know, I go, okay, well maybe I don't have a lot on, but I will, put myself in a scenario where I can keep myself busy. I can learn something new. I can do some work on my own project or whatever it may be. But that dynamic of I need to sit and, you know, eat smoothies from our blender and work or, Hey, I'm good. Let's go and do a bunch of fun stuff for two weeks. Like for example, this trip we just did, we just spent three and a half, four weeks in moto taxis in the middle of the mountains and working was not, Working was not so easy during this trip. So, you know, even though my partner did take a few conference calls in the back of the tuk-tuk, which was hilarious. <laughs> I would pay to hear those calls. <laughs> <laughs> 
if if I'm the client on the other end, I wouldn't even care. I would be like, that's that's awesome. I, I'm, I'm Respect, happy. you I'm, made I'm, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm telling people at the bar later on that afternoon. Yeah, I took a, I took a call with someone who was riding in the back of the tuk tuk. Yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. On on this topic, uh, how are there times where one of you is hunkered down and the other person is like, okay, well, I'm gonna go do this, and you know, either goes out. Uh, on a little mini adventure or just goes out for the night with people they've met? Um, are there times where you go out uh, without your partner and vice versa? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, yeah, we definitely have those times. Uh, my partner a bit more than me. Uh, she's definitely <laughs> keeping herself super busy. Uh, but no, we, I mean, there's, there's times where, I mean, look, the nature of travel, it's not even just work. Sometimes you just don't feel like doing something, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. it might not be yeah, a hangover. Yeah, yeah. You might just say, Hey, I need to, I need like two days just to rest because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, of course, every day is fun. But like anything, when you're having fun every day, you get kind of tired. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> so, yeah, there, there could be times, whether it's work or, you know, just wanting to chill out on your own, have some alone time. It's also important. Uh, and, you know, I'll go out and go see some uh, cool lookout point or go to some cool restaurant or bar with some people we met or. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's just going out on your own and doing something. That's definitely a dynamic that I think is uh, super important. And, definitely. And one that, the one that we have as well. It's just, hey, go away. I want to be alone for a day. It's like, cool. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Okay. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Communication. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. Let's switch this up a little bit and talk about strictly the traveling aspect of your journey. Uh, you listed El Salvador as one of your, one of your favorite destinations thus far. What made it so special to you? Yeah, I mean, for me, it, I don't know if it sounds cheesy or not. I, I, I'm pretty sure it we all cheesy. kind of yeah. cheesy. <laughs> Cut it. Cheesy. Yeah, we all we all kind of crave. Uh, for me, obviously, just new experiences in general. But uh, you know, me in particular, I really love to be in environments where uh, I'm forced to speak a new language or like just fully immerse myself in a culture. We've all been to places that were full of tourists and you could speak For English sure. to everyone and it was easy to make friends. And there was lo- lots of things that kind of cater to the backpacking tourist. Um, but for me, El Salvador was the polar opposite. So uh, for people that don't know, I mean, it was for a decade, one of the most dangerous countries in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they have, kind of just come out of this era of kind of sadness and and zero tourism and a lot of danger and crime. And so almost from the moment we arrived, uh, there was a lot of uh, Americans who had um, emigrated and left the country many, many years ago. And they were also coming back to their own home country for the first time and just so excited, you know, oh my gosh, where are you guys from? What are you doing here? Oh, we rented a big four by four truck. We're going to drive the country. That's amazing. You have to go here. You got to go here and here and here. Um, and so the whole experience was just really, really special because we felt like, uh, I don't know, pioneers. It felt like a country that really no one had gone to. And we were seeing, you know, the countryside of this place and meeting, meeting locals. And it was a really, really uh, immersive experience and one that kind of completely uh, came out of the window for like we just we had no idea what to expect we were kind of expecting it to be a little dangerous and things but of course as per usual it, you know it turned out to be the polar opposite it was some of the kindest people we met it was it was just it felt like it was a group of four people in a car and it felt like we had a whole country to ourselves it was it was really really something special yeah and that must so have been I a get, cool feeling and so i get why the adventure was special when you frame it that way but what did you actually do and see that you know, what would stand out or would catch someone's attention if, if you were to promote El Salvador to them? Yeah, I mean, like a lot of uh, Central American countries, the landscape is gorgeous. You know, they've got volcanoes every five kilometers that just yeah. stretch up into the sky and you can hike up them and see, uh, you know, Honduras. You can see other countries. You just view forever and ever and ever. I mean, the food was one of those things I'd never heard of El Salvadorian food in my life. They had what? Never. I mean, here's the thing. I'm Canadian and yeah, a lot of my, I, yeah, pupusas, pupusas. of course, a lot of my adult years in New Zealand, that's a little bit of a mission for El Salvadorian people. So mm-hmm. I, I, there wasn't much El Salvadorian stuff there, but 
the food was amazing, the pupusas. Um, and yeah, for me, like after seeing, you know, the amount of countries I have, uh, the people, you really get a feel for um, a, a lot of countries have kind people, but the people in this country, uh, it, you, it, it, it was a country that felt like it was on the rebuild and it was very uplifting every little town you went to that people were so interested in knowing who you were and where you came from and wanting to show you their family. And, you know, just they, they were so excited about um, showing people El Salvador and how beautiful it is and um, all of the things that we just mentioned. Um, it was something I hadn't really experienced before because a lot of other places are used to seeing uh, tourists, whether it might yeah. be backpackers or, you know, more expensive tourists, whatever it might be there, you know, there are more places are used to seeing that. And, and there you really got a special feeling that uh, this was a place that in five, 10 years might be the next uh, Colombia or Mexico or something, you know, it was, it was very fascinating and it was really special. Yeah, and you're, you're one of many that have recently told me El Salvador is the true hidden gem in Central America. I did an entire mm. episode on Nicaragua, which is where my family's from, so I was a little yeah. biased. But <laughs> that episode produced a few responses that said, oh, no, you got to try El Salvador. I was like, <laughs> okay, okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll speak on it a little bit more highly. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, you know, earlier in the pod, I mentioned how your partner went from a girlfriend to a fiance on this trip. And we already talked about how any sort of extended travel with a partner can be a big test on any relationship. And clearly you two passed each other's tests in your mind. When did you say, okay, this is a person for me and tell our listeners a little bit more about your engagement day, because it is fascinating. Sure. Yeah. Uh, very good. We'll get into the sappy love stuff. Love it. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. If I'm honest, I kind of knew, I kind of knew before um, we went on this trip, actually, that she was the one for me. I figured it out on my previous trip. It was very much a classic romance novel. You don't know what you have until it's gone scenario. Uh, and I was meeting all of these other friends and ladies in my trip and, you know, no one ever kind of came up to scruff. So, that was what sparked uh, us to do this trip together in general, because I didn't want to stop traveling, of course, and yeah, she wasn't yeah. quite ready to start. And so when she was, there we went. Uh, so basically, it was more of a, unless catastrophe strikes, <laughs> this is what I expect should hopefully happen. Um, and yeah, we, we just, you know, as I said, we, we really both uh, just had such a fantastic time experiencing everything together. And like any of course, couple of friends would. We, of course, had fights, but nothing ever extreme, you know, just just the little stuff that's expected. Yeah. <laughs> so as we, we uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start from here is uh, we both dive and, you know, as when we met you, John, but we've dreamed of going to the Galapagos for many, many years. We both love, uh, you know, marine life and the ocean. And so this was something that was kind of high on our bucket list for quite some time. Uh, and so I got a ring in Canada, actually, I got a custom made ring in my hometown when we were back just to see family for the summer. And uh, I carried it in my backpack for seven months. Bold. Uh, <laughs> Bold. <laughs> yeah, the lady who made it thought I was insane, uh, which, you know, I couldn't really dispute that. <laughs> a key, key here is air tags, people put air tags in yeah. absolutely everything. So <laughs> So carried this ring with me, and th that was always the plan, was, uh, was Galapagos, and had lots of family who were messaging me, when are you going to do it, blah, 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 blah. So we went to the Galapagos, and uh, I was waiting for the right time, waiting for the right time. It's never going to be the right time. Uh, but we were on the island of San Cristobal, and they have one of the largest sea lion colonies. I won't say the world, because I don't know that's the case, but it is unbelievable, it just thousands of sea lions on, on the beach. So I thought, oh, this would be great. I'll propose and then, you know, maybe we'll get attacked by sea lions. This will make for a great, a great engagement We'll scenario. go viral for sure. <laughs> so we, we go to a beach and it was a beautiful sunset. But then, of course, in true fashion with my luck, it started to pour down with rain. So we get soaked all walking on our way to this beach. We arrive at the beach. I was going, perfect. There's going to be all the sea lions. There was one sea lion. 
Uh, <laughs> so I try to set it up, of course, with my camera because I, you know, I'm not going to not capture this moment. And Correct. We're we're both soaking wet in the pouring rain, and I she's used to me telling her to go pose in places for videos and things of that nature. So she poses uh, right in front of the sea lion. Uh, he proceeds to run after her and chase her, and so she runs away. Then the sea lion rolls away. So I'm here with a rainy shot, no sea lions, uh, with a little bit of sunset in the background. And I just said, you know what? After all this, I, I can't I can't put this off any longer. So I went and popped the question, and and that was that. She, uh, I, you know, didn't run away. So <laughs> and, and, and you know, and to anyone listening, I, I thought I had come up with the perfect plan of proposing and uh here's rogan who just blew half of our listeners out of the water proposing in the galapagos while diving Incredible. the bar has been raised yeah. I, I tell you what though no matter how much planning you put into it if that story didn't express to you that it's never going to go that, the way you think it is then mm -hmm. i don't know For what sure. will <laughs> For sure. um speaking of your fiance what impact uh has she had in your life um you know, in terms of travel, professional development? Yeah, huge. I mean, if, if uh, I had done this trip solo, like I said, uh, I probably would have made two videos in the last year and a half because I, I, I'm i by far the, the big extrovert. And so, you know, for me, going to hostels and partying and doing crazy adventures with people, and this is the way I've always been accustomed to travel. So it's been a kind of a full 360 for me of, uh, but she's brought uh, enjoyment into my life doing these things. So she's always been a super driven and focused, passionate person with when, especially when it comes to work and she really loves what she does. And um, I've seen her uh, succeed exponentially since we've left. And so that's been really motivating to me because uh, you know, she was someone who was also very much trapped in the uh, corporate nine to five cycle. She was terrified to quit her job. Uh, you know, she was as what my, anyone would be. I right. Think. Yeah. And, and in my opinion, she was being grossly underpaid. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people feel the same. And she ended up taking the leap and it took some time. But, you know, now she's got clients all over the world, some in the US and New Zealand and Europe. And and she's just really hit a stride that is uh, it's inspiring for me to see, because, you know, I think one of the biggest things people struggle with, including myself sometimes, is not seeing the success you expect to see by certain uh, ominous dates you put in your head, you know, like uh, uh, for instance, with my personal career in YouTube and other filmmaking, uh, you know, I, I would, if you asked me a year ago, I probably would have thought I would have had a bigger following or I'd be making more money or, but at the end of the day, that's, that's not really what's important, but you have to remind yourself of that. You know, it's, it's more so, it's the classic cheesy line of enjoy the journey, you know, not yeah. that it's not about the destination. And, uh, and she really showed that I suppose, because she enjoys what she does. I think a lot of people don't a lot time for the educational and trial and error stage of, you know, creating a business or developing a skill set. And so a lot of the times like people expect to see progress immediately after embarking on this journey where it's like, Hey, you actually haven't, put in the time for the education and for the trial and error. And so you're, you're not going to see progress without understanding the foundations, developing your niche, and then kind of like, you know, attempting to execute and then yeah. touching on goals. I mean, it's nice to have foresight of like, Hey, that would be a great goal to hit at this time. And if you leave it there as a hypothetical, sometimes you'll blow that goal out of the water. I don't want to say without even trying, but without, you know, stressing it. Yes. And sometimes, that's the beauty of it when it works out when you're least expecting it to. Did, did my co-host Max Gonzalez say that or Warren Buffett? That, <laughs> that's probably been the most insightful thing. I was over here taking notes. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, for sure. But, Rogan, what piece of advice would you give someone who wants to embark on this type of lifestyle? Things that you wish you would have known before you got started. Yeah. Piece of advice. Uh, yeah, I think... One of the biggest things I tell people is, um, well, there's a couple of things, but, you know, when you travel and I guess when people ask me, once again, it ties into kind of the, the question or the thought of how do you do it, right? What I try to tell people is 
do what feels right. So, you know, you see people who travel for two years at a time like me, or you see someone who does one month long holidays and then goes back to work. You know, there's nothing wrong with, with either because truly the lifestyle you want to live uh, totally depends on you and not what anyone else is doing. You know, so if you only have $5,000 in the bank and you go, oh, Rogan saved up way more. I, I can't afford to do that. It's, it's the wrong way of thinking about it. Of course you can, but you might have to go on workaway.com and find a farm that will, you know, put you up for free and feed you. And yeah. all you got to spend your money on is, I don't know, some snacks and maybe going out for beers. It's, there's ways, if you really want it, if you really want to do something, there's always a way to do it. It's not going to be easy. Nothing is ever easy. But I guess the, the, to sum that up is just find out what you want to do and what suits you and pursue that. Don't try to travel like other people or go on holidays like other people. Just do what works for you. Well said. And so before we finish, we thought we'd hit you with a few rapid fire questions about the last 16 months of your life. So I hope you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Best city or country that you've been to so far? Ooh, this is a very, very hard question. Probably the hardest question to answer, but I will say Vietnam is a country. Okay. Best beverage you've had, alcoholic or otherwise? Ooh, geez. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to give Peru a leg up. I'm going to say Pisco Sours. They are delicious. Okay, there we go. I agree. <laughs> uh most underrated city or country? Most underrated city or country? Oof, these are actually, I'm, I'm very impressed. These are pretty tough questions. <laughs> uh, I mean, we were on the topic of El Salvador. I will, yeah, I'm going to give it to El Salvador as a country. Most okay. underrated. Best country for food? Best country for food, ooh, Mexico by a country mile. <laughs> okay. And so last one, it's kind of you and your fiance here. So both of yeah. you are divers. So it's only fitting we end with this question, the country with the best diving. This is also a very tough one because each country tends to have one or two fantastic spots. Mm -hmm. um, but Oh, if and I if was you to want get... to make a dive site too, I was going to, that was going to be my original question. Dive site. Yeah. In Malaysia, uh, Sipadan in Malaysia as a dive site is unbelievable. Uh, the best I've done out of 60, 70 dives. But if I was to give a whole country, I would give Indonesia the leg up because they have so many islands and so it's the, the vastness of diving is incredible and they're all very good dives too. So, yeah. John, that sounds like we have to do a work trip uh, to those sites. So, yes. Hey, I'm going to Indonesia in November, so I'm, I'm getting ready for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Live aboard. It's the best way to do it. Anyways, Rogan, uh, thank you so much for being on our show, man. We really appreciate you, all the insight, and uh, you know, just hearing about your your journey with your partner has just been fantastic. It's super inspiring, and uh, you know, I'm just super grateful to have you on here. If our listeners want to learn more about you, where can they find you? Uh, yeah, you can, since my name is, uh, kind of like a weird, uh, <laughs> a, a not usual name is the best way to put it. You can look me up on pretty much anything just by my name. So Instagram, Rogan Steel, YouTube, Rogan Steel, Facebook, all, all, all the above. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much. It's been really, really cool. I've been following your guys journey as well since I met John. Uh, and it's an awesome thing you guys are doing here. You get really cool people on and I'm honored because compared to some of these amazing people you've had on here. Uh, yeah. No, no, <laughs> you are cool. an amazing traveler. You and your partner, <laughs> and you have amazing content, which we will share and obviously give you credit for when your episode comes out. Um, Max, if they want to find out a little bit more about us, they can by visiting our website at www.gtspodcast.com. They can also find us on Instagram or Facebook at Globetrotters Podcast, Twitter at Globetrot Pod. Make sure you drop us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify if you enjoyed listening to this conversation or any streaming platform of your choice. That's right. And editing was done by Jonathan Artero. And last but not least, Rogan, thank you so, so much for being here. And to everyone else out there, thanks for listening. Until next thanks, time. Thanks, guys.